All right, thanks everybody. Really excited that you're here and uh, here to see Ed Sloop of Walsh Construction present on the PAE Engineers New Portland office, a living buildings construction details. So with that, I'm gonna hand it off to the co-hosts. Thanks. Awesome, thank you virtual Zach and real Zach. <laughs> <laughs> and good evening friends. And if you're new here, a really warm welcome. I'm Shannon from Sanderson Design zooming in from New Hope, PA on the East Coast. And you're about to see our presenter show, A Living Building Project, with all its construction details, successes and failures from the site tonight and from the design side tomorrow. Everyone's invited to join the chat, take screen captures, share on social media, and we'll be sharing links in the chat throughout from the presenters and with each other. So introduce yourself, find a friend, and get ready to hear why Ed Sloop and his team want to build something lasting together. Mark, over to you. Well, thank you, Shannon. And uh, virtual Zach was awesome tonight. Uh, so, hey, I have to say um, I'm excited for tonight. We had a chance to review the presentation with Ed and Jake last night. And it, it would be wonderful if we could have three or four hours tonight because that would only touch on all the details of this amazing project. I'm excited and I'm also excited to, to learn what everyone else likes. So for those of you that don't have questions with a queue, if you have comments and you're like, what is that? Or I love that, or, we did that here. I wanna, I wanna know that from your perspective, whether you're a contractor, designer, a modeler, or a supplier, we'd love to hear your take on it. Um, I'm so excited for tonight and I pass the mic to Sean. Good evening, everyone. I'm Sean Sandemore in Vancouver, British Columbia. It is day two of this week in the Accelerator world because hopefully you caught some technical, some technique and technology yesterday with Mike Karen from Intertech Windows. So hopefully you got to check that out. If not, in a couple of days, it'll be on the Accelerator's YouTube page. Welcome to Tuesday, Wednesday, if you're across the pond. And happy you're here. Over to you, Kevin. Thank you, Sean. I am uh, proud to introduce Ed Sloop of Walsh Construction and Jake Lamana of, of uh, Walsh Construction. I, uh, I'm honored to, to uh, cross paths with you guys. I've only crossed paths with a few Walsh Construction guys at Building Science Summer Camp. I've seen their presentations before. They knocked my socks off. I've been introduced to the term or the job title in Walsh Construction of the skin doctor, the person responsible for all the air barriers, water barriers to make sure that it happens right. And, you know, this project from the run through has all that and then some, some quite technical details. It's all based in, in building science. And uh, I'm really excited to, to, to share everyone the experience and the expertise they have. Uh, Ed is a uh, chief estimator and a senior project manager with Walsh. And I'll let him introduce himself. And uh, you guys just keep the chat going and we'll ask a lot of questions and learn a lot. Living build challenge is definitely a challenge. So let's kick it off the show. Okay, hey, hey uh, thanks, Kevin. Uh, Jake's here with me. You'll see his uh, name up on the screen. He's one of our QC managers and he was uh, integral on this project on the envelope. So what we're gonna do tonight is uh, I'm gonna share my screen here and uh, hopefully everybody can see that. Uh, we're gonna basically take you on a photo journal uh, through the project uh, for the things that uh, this group is probably interested in, hopefully interested in. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the project to begin with. Oh, oops, so hold on a second. Here we go. So uh, first, going to tell you a little bit about what we built. So 57,000 foot office building. This was designated as a historic landmark uh, before we even got a permit, which we thought was interesting. It's on track to be a living building. Uh, we think it's going to have a 500 year useful life. And uh, it's built to seismic level four, which is the same as a hospital. We're, we're not gonna talk a lot about this, but thought you would be interested. Um, we built this on a site that was a parking lot. And before that, way back like 150 years ago, this is what was on the site. Um, there may be some people on this call who are interested in project costs. So there's a little info here. We, we built the core and shell of this developer driven project. So there's no subsidy in it for 24.8 million. And then we put a whole boatload of solar PV on another project. I'm gonna talk about that a little later in the um, broadcast here. 
And then we're also building out for PAE engineers on the, and Elon and Company, New Building Institute and Earth Advantage. Those are tenants that are gonna occupy the top three floors of these buildings. So they're like-minded folks to the people who are listening right now. Um, for those who don't know, PAE Engineers is a mechanical electrical engineering firm, mechanical electrical plumbing and um, engineering firm that uh, is here on the West Coast. Uh, but they do, their offices are West Coast, they do work uh, all around the country. And we may have a bank uh, also on the second floor. We've been working on this project since January of 2018. We had a long pre-construction period in order to get uh, all the ends to meet, do the permitting, which was very lengthy. And um, we just got occupancy a couple weeks ago. We're going through commissioning and uh, lots of commissioning. There's lots of um, systems, which you're gonna see. And then there'll be a performance period happens after that. So total is about 64 month project. What I'm gonna to talk to you about tonight is are these four things, uh, take you through some of the structure because we have a mass timber building. Um, the passive house accelerator folks thought that might be of interest to you. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that. MEP systems, which there's a bunch of, uh, go through a bunch of the envelope and then the roof, which is kind of special as well. And so then I'm gonna switch over here to some pictures. Can everybody see that okay? Bunch of rebar, everybody say yes. Yes, lots of rebar. Yes, thank you. Okay, so not a lot. I'm not going to talk a lot about this, just seismic level four, lots of rebar, lots of concrete, and we're going to wrap a wood building around it. This is the beginning of the wood building right here. Um, you'll see it's a, it's a CLT and glue lamb uh, wood mass timber building around this concrete uh, core, all, all FSC uh, lumber. That's what the frame looked like uh, when it was complete. <clears throat> it's in a downtown, it's in downtown Portland, so kind of a tight site. Uh, here, what you see is the wood building wrapped around the concrete core. This gives you an idea of just how thick those concrete walls are, like relative to elevator door. They're about two feet thick on the ground level. This is showing that we, we use this chase system for uh, routing of uh, MEP systems between the CLT panels. These are five ply panels. And kind of looking at that exterior wall right there. These are used for hanging. Um, it's a unistrut thing that's in there to hang uh, systems from. This gives you a feel for sort of as we're more complete. What you see here is uh, part of our efforts to protect this wood frame. Um, the project start got pushed because of permitting. So we started April 1st of last year, uh, right about the time that COVID was uh, really kind of getting its grip. Um, and so that pushed the wood frame into the fall and the winter. You'll see here, this is November of last year. So this is taping all the joints between the CLT panels right here and the uh, chases. That's what we were looking at before. Here you'll see from below part of our attempts to manage the water. Everything you see in the wood or the concrete here, 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 uh, this, that's all finished product. So we're out here, everything is exposed and we got to protect this finished product and we got to manage the water. So that's what that is. <clears throat> we were building right next to uh, another building. It's a air break now. And so uh, this is like one of those zero clearance conditions with the seismic joint. That level four resiliency um, reduced the seismic drip, drift. So we, we have a smaller joint uh, on the other side of this, but we need to allow room for movement there. So that's what this is. You can kind of see here, we're getting above that building that's next door. And you can see what uh, that's what's on the other side of the CMU there. We chose to do this with light gauge metal because of the floor to floor height. So this is just showing you that we were using light gauge metal framing, showing you the water management right here. This is for the radiant heating and cooling those copper lines. We're gonna talk about that in a little bit. This is the seismic joint. Um, so what we were looking at before that CMU is down here. Here you'll see the halfens to support the brick uh, and just kind of the working conditions there. And then here, uh, this is where we come, the old building next to the new and kind of how we dealt with that condition. This is an, it's an all masonry building. You're gonna see that in a few more slides. Uh, this is to show uh, how the uh, structure 
and everything is exposed. So what you see is kind of the finished product. And that was a big deal. Uh, again, here, protecting the glue lambs. This is pouring out the slab. We're gonna get into the radiant PD and cooling. You kind of get a little feel for it there. Now we're shifting into the MEP systems. This is a look at the mechanical room. You can't see everything, but this is just to give you a feel for like what's there. This, the building is, it does have a high performance envelope which we're gonna talk about, but has a lot of um, mechanical, electrical and plumbing systems, which we're gonna focus on mechanical electrical tonight. These are the heat pump water heaters, um, one view of them. And then this is showing the proximity to the MDF room. So this is all uh, servers and data equipment that generate heat. This equipment likes heat and rejects uh, cool air. So these two, play well together. So that was a very intentional engineering move right there. I'm gonna zoom in. I was told I need to zoom way in. So what we're looking at here, this is the uh, radiant heating and cooling. So we have this on floors two through five. We don't have it at the ground level. You're gonna see some pictures of this, but in essence, uh, it's zoned, multiple zones at every floor. You'll see uh, heat exchangers here and then uh, VRF units up at the roof right there. And then uh, these uh, hydro kits here and the manifolds here. And you're going to see pictures of all that stuff. So just in a nutshell, not to give you the whole schooling on it, but there we go. These are, these are not for the uh, radiant heating and cooling. These are for the ventilation uh, heating and cooling. The BRF units on the roof. Here's the radiant heating and cooling going in on top of an acoustical mat. So we use this acoustical matting also as part of our um, defense against water. So all these joints also got taped and we had a crew that was constantly uh, working to manage the water here again, managing water, managing water over here. This is a uh, the radiant, remember I showed you those copper pipes, that's what this is coming up uh, to service the manifold. And then all that tubing that was in the slab, it's all brought together in uh, one location in these manifolds here. So this is at the perimeter of the building. And then back at the core, this is a similar uh, manifold back at the core. And these are all um, uh, working together with hydro kits that are down in the mechanical room, which is, that's what these are. And then these are, in turn working together with those um, compressors up on the roof, the heat pumps on the roof, which are these. Then here we get into the, um, the space heating and cooling. So there's not, there's not a lot of, of uh, duct work on this project. There's only one exhaust fan for like the general spaces, which is pretty amazing for a 57,000 foot building, at least in my opinion. And part of that is because this building is using um, natural ventilation through the windows, which we're going to talk about in a minute. So these two are balanced right here. And then we have this over here for the composters, which we're not going to talk about. There's heat recovery at every floor. There's a big heat recovery unit at the ground level for this ground level system here. And then at each floor above, there's a smaller one that comes out of the core. So that big... Uh, heat recovery unit, ERV, that's this right here. Uh, I don't know if you remember the uh, heat pump water heaters, they're right here. So it gives you a feel of scale. This is about the size of a person, maybe a little bigger than a person. These are the motor operated windows. So that here's the motor operator, it goes right here. This is an on and goes out. And, um, and then these are all tied into the, um, the BMS or DDC control system to allow the building to flush out it. Uh, night. Now we're switching to power. So this is the uh, sort of the beginning of the PV racking on the office building itself. Um, just gives you a feel for kind of what's going on there. And then this is more of the finished product. The racking on this was pretty special. You'll see this kind of articulated pattern here. That was very intentional by PAE. Uh, they wanted to get more surface area of uh, PV, PV panel surface area on the roof. This is one way to do it. Um, 
and then these were very high performance panels. Uh, I'm, I'm told I can't tell you exactly what the rating is without looking it up. I don't know that off the top of my head. Here's the inverters. Uh, this is just showing you all the different, some of the different parts and kind of scale, how big they are. And then I mentioned earlier how we couldn't fit everything on the roof. I'm going to go back for a second. You'll see here that the top of these are all below the parapet. And this building has good solar exposure here. It's in this historic district. So unlike the Bullet Center, uh, for those who, um, the Bullet Center was sort of the first and largest living building. This is like Bullet Center 2.0. On that one, they, they put the, uh, extended the PV over the edge of the parapet in order to get more area. We weren't allowed to do that here because of the historic district that the building is located in. So, uh, and we had, need of quite a bit more uh, PV capacity than what would fit on this roof. So we needed to find another place to do it. And um, Walsh happened to be working on another project uh, that, that uh, I also happened to be working on and was going to meetings on both projects, you know, in this, each one each week. And when this came up was like, hey, there's, I know where there's a big roof and maybe the people there would, uh, would be okay with putting this large system on uh, their roof. And, and so what this is, this is that other project, uh, and this is affordable housing for a, a local nonprofit. And so we engaged with them and, um, and basically made a deal where uh, they got all of this PV, this entire PV system, which is about a uh, $670,000 system. They got it, they get it for free. They get all the power that comes from it. And then, uh, but the renewable energy credits accrue to the office building for purposes of living building challenge. So this is, this picture really is just to show you in totality how much PV uh, is being used on this project to make it net positive energy. This plus everything on the other roof. These are the batteries. So the building also has a battery, battery energy storing, storage system. Uh, in island mode, the building can go in summer, it could go for about 100 days without being connected to the grid. These batteries, they needed to change uh, the original LG Chem. They had an issue with thermal runaway. So you'll see this is Eon is the manufacturer. Uh, I just bring that up because uh, LG Chem no longer will allow build batteries um, battery energy systems in buildings. They make bigger ones that go for like uh, solar farms and stuff like that. This is the microgrid energy uh, system. It's a pretty small package, but pretty powerful. And there was a very custom agreement that was created between uh, the building owner here and the local power utility, PGE, um, so what this does, working with that battery energy storage system, is allow the power to go to and from the grid uh, at times that are optimal for, um, for the grid, like when they need it. And then that means that when, it's, when they need it, of course, they're going to pay more for it. And so this is pretty, it's very unique here in Portland. Uh, and I think pretty unique to buildings. They use it in other applications, is my understanding. This is just kind of a fun slide. Thought you guys might be interested. They, they, the lighting engineers, uh, they put this here, this light show. The more people go up and down these stairs, these lights change color. And so presumably they'll take more trips up and down the stairs, which would be good for their health. And it'll also cause the elevator to be used less, which will use less energy. So kind of fun. This is what the building looks like. We're moving into the envelope phase here. This is what the building looks like, um, all brick. Again, this is to be consistent with the neighborhood. You saw the picture of what was there 150 years ago. They look different, but that was, they were, they, it was intentional trying to get them to be kind of, this to be historic looking. Uh, point out up here, you'll see this recess. This is where there's some planters and this is called a decany. And, and that was put in, there are some unique waterproofing issues with this, which, um, Jake will probably touch on, I'll touch on briefly, uh, but this was put in up here in order to allow for uh, some connection to the outside and some urban agriculture. And it was a compromise because there used to be a, uh, like a uh, outdoor amenity on level two on the other side of the building, kitty corner to this. 
And uh, all that footage was reclaimed and brought back into the building to help the financial model work. And then this was kind of an innovation to put this up here. And there's a real nice space behind that, which we probably won't get into tonight, but uh, suffice it to say a pretty, a pretty uh, innovative solution there. Okay, so to the building envelope, uh, starting at the base, uh, what you're gonna see as we go along, uh, you're gonna see how complicated the brick is. You're also gonna see um, all the different conditions uh, for like waterproofing and insulation and, and how they were dealt with. So here we had the form work for this fancy brick and we had to get insulation behind it. So that's what that is. Here you'll see insulation uh, spray foam up against that CMU wall that we talked about earlier. Oh, and by the way, protecting the wood as we go. And this is up at that decony. Uh, we used all rock wool. All the products in this building need to be red list compliant. For those of you who know what red list is, I, I won't go into the details, but there was a very rigorous process to select all the materials to make sure they didn't have anything bad in them. Up at the roof, uh, more spray foam, trying to have continuity of the thermal barrier. Inside, filling the cavities with uh, insulation. Outside, more roxel on the outside. And then uh, this is showing sort of our typical window, uh, window wrap. Uh, we self-perform that uh, for uh, quality purposes and uh, guys did a great job. There's a typical window going in. So this process was uh, similar to most of the buildings that we do. Uh, Jake supervised the details of all this and we, as uh, I think it was Kevin mentioned, we had our, we had a good skin doctor on this project and then these are our guys putting in the window. These are dual glaze Cascadia fiberglass uh, windows. Also, because of proximity to the neighboring buildings, both on the west and on the north, because the north can be built on, we had to put in fire, uh, fire rated windows. So these are not the Cascadia. This was a special window that we had to put in to be code compliant. This, oh, actually, we do have a, a picture of it. So that decony I showed you uh, wraps around this, and these are all nano wall. Uh, so there's five of these. They open up, so you have one you know, large opening here, large opening here, large opening here. We've had some challenges with those uh, in terms of passing water tests. Uh, they, I think we're getting there and uh, we were sort of going above and beyond. Um, so these are great, uh, but they do have some challenges. They're, they're not as, uh, as air and water tight as the Cascadia product. And now we're getting into uh, getting going with the brick. So this is showing how complicated uh, some of the concrete got just in support of the envelope. Here's uh, the metal studs and the support for the brick, the halfens. These were, I don't know if you saw it in the other one, I didn't point it out, I apologize. These get lagged into the CLT and then the topping slab goes on top. And in this particular case, they're behind this upturned beam. If you go around the corner, they're not, there's no, no beam around the corner. This is showing the brick support. Um, and how we've got kind of an inverted uh, ledger angle and they're, they're continuous and there's some space behind them to get a little bit of insulation. This is showing the complexity of the brick in support of this historic uh, look. You can see how things step out. This was the only place they allowed us to have exposed steel, support steel. More uh, complexity, these were pre, uh, prefabricated uh, brick bond beams that we then fastened into place uh, while also getting some insulation behind them and making sure we had a good weather barrier. Complexity of the corners, you see the brick running different directions. It's running vertically, it's running horizontally, uh, it's stepping in and out, custom shapes uh, while still paying attention to the building envelope and getting you know back at the face of the building. This is showing the level of control required, all those red uh, red jack lines to keep control. This is the beginning of a uh, thin brick program right here. This, this all gets wrapped because this, this steps out, then in, then wraps around. The other thing that's kind of interesting is this is the high water mark for the highest flood in Portland, which was back in the 1800s. And this is where uh, uh, somebody who knows more about this than I do said that if we don't get climate change under control, the water level might be. So that's kind of sobering. 
here's that thin brick uh, wrapping into that opening. Uh, again, maintaining insulation up here behind there. And there's the thin brick when it's finished. Looks like the other stuff. So now you don't see any supporting steel. And then just this is just saying, uh, showing that we have a lot of uh, sort of custom sheet metal work that's required to make this all um, meet the design intent. Um, I'm trying to remember what I was showing you here. This is this is on the one side of the building. I think this was more of a site logistics picture and showing insulation, what we were doing there, plus how we were supporting the scaffold. But this is when we come around the corner on one side of the building where the, a, another parking lot is. This is showing a transition from Norman brick to econ brick and the space in between. So, I mean, there's a lot of building science, uh, building envelope experts on the call right now. I'm sure this uh, saved a fair bit of money making that kind of, it was a sleight of eye, if you will. So I thought that was kind of interesting. We're showing, this is a, a detail of that decany. I'll zoom in a little bit, um, just to show you the concept and kind of the complexity around that whole thing. It was really, it's pretty cool, but it was kind of a pain in the butt, to be honest with you. Um, zoom back out. So this is this is it kind of part way through. This is it with a metal roof. And then uh, this gets fiberglass planters that go on top and there's the irrigation system for it. Now we're to the roof. Um, how am I doing? I'm at 25 minutes. I was told I had 25 minutes. We're dead. The roof is the last part, so I'm doing okay here. So the roof has a pretty good story, I think. Uh, again, we were pushed into winter. You'll see this is a little bit before Christmas of last year. What you see here is uh, a vapor barrier that we, we really had to get this building in the dry as fast as we could. So uh, there was a lot of work done, um, just, you know, not long before we signed the contract and then after we were already going, trying to get this worked out because remember that start date changed. So this was originally going to be when the weather was good and it wasn't going to be an issue. Then that changed. So we got to work. Jake helped us. Marty, our uh, Jake's predecessor, also helped and a bunch of others to get this kind of this two ply uh, vapor barrier that could go down and in a wetter climate. We have a topping slab on top of this. So this is the rebar for that. These are the fall protection anchors. This is really to show you the order of how things were done. Uh, these require obviously greater sort of structural support. That's why they went in there for structural anchoring. Here we are pouring that topping slab. There's those roof anchors. Then that gave us a nice flat surface to put in all the stanchions to support that solar. So there's a whole lot of these and you can start to see how there's a whole lot of penetrations in this roof that need to be managed. Um, this worked out great because the, again, these could be laid out for that all encompassing PV system More of that, a little bit more of that, then uh, roof to wall tie in for, um, perspective, protecting the wood structure and not letting water get down in there. Now you start to see the roof, uh, layers coming together. Why this is in here is because of this, this is called channel dry. And uh, I don't think we'd ever heard of this before. I'm sure there's some on the call because uh, we've got a bunch of subject matter experts here that have. But this was really kind of the, one of the secret ingredients to this whole thing was by putting this layer down, it allowed air to move within this kind of waffle structure. Uh, then we could put the other layer, the rest of the insulation in and the cover board and the membrane. And this roof could then breathe in perpetuity. So remember, the vapor barrier is below this slab. This slab needs to uh, uh, breathe and uh, dry out over time. We didn't have time to wait, and we were in the wet season. So this allowed that. It allows it to just basically um, uh, breathe in perpetuity through vents that are very similar to plumbing vents. Here you can see it on the bottom and then the rest of the layers. You can see it start to come together. We were very intentional trying to make all the penetrations round so that as far as the roofing system was concerned, the, it, you know, it just felt like a bunch of plumbing vents. And uh, so all of this is round. This is a fully warrantable roof. This is also a water collection surface. Uh, we already talked about that. This is basically showing those round, um, the round penetrations and how those were dealt with. 
And that is it. So, hey, 29 minutes done. Phenomenal job, Ed. Thank you. Can you can you uh, talk a little bit because it interests me about how you guys use mass climbers for the uh, the that that facade and how you know how how that sped up or you know made your construction a little more efficient? Yes, I stopped sharing just so I, <laughs> so I could see you. Yes, absolutely. Um, so uh, we were able to put the we call them hydro mobiles here, mass climbers. We actually were able to use those on all four sides. They're great because. Uh, we could load them up. We, we kept the crane. We needed the crane for the concrete. We needed a crane for the uh, mass timber. We were working with, we negotiated to work with the masons. Kind of interesting. The masonry job was so difficult that uh, we, there were, it was down to two and one of them walked away because he said, hey, this is going to use too many of my good people. <laughs> and uh, so we can't do it. So that left us with the one. And um, so we were able to help either load, move their climber systems and also load them with the crane and with the forklift and then they can just go up and down and be right there next to the work and it also allowed our guys to use them for the the wrb and the window install and i mean great working platform strong they move a little slow but at the end of the day it's we love them here we use them all the time does that answer the question and then we we had oh. to get creative on that west side with how we supported it and uh, uh we borrowed that from somebody else in town, we saw it on another project. We're like, hey, that's a perfect fit for this job. Let's see if we can do it here. And it was the first time we had done it, but it, it won't be the last because it worked out great. No, that, that answers the question perfectly. I've been beating the drum of uh, Hydromobiles mass climbers in the New York City climate because uh, and the construction industry here because uh, they're using suspended scaffolding going manual sometimes. And I'm like, no, that's slow. I'm a, oh, I'm a yeah, and just from a safety standpoint, Kevin, I mean, it, it doesn't move around. It doesn't care so much if it's windy. And like, if, we, if you're using conventional scaffold, yeah, you could wrap conventional scaffold. You can, you know, you can kind of wrap these, they move, but you could get something across the top if you need it. And yeah, way safer for sure. Yeah, good for productivity. Well, even yeah. too of having all the lines coming down, I mean, like from a quality standpoint, there's just also that and just being able to ensure the details you're trying to do. I mean, like there's a lot of amazing bricks coming into play there and you guys just nailed it. So yeah, good work by your, by your crew. We, we, had a, we had a good sub and we have, uh, we also are very fortunate that in-house uh, we have some, some really smart, really detailed oriented layout people uh who they just go through stuff and an eighth of an inch isn't good enough uh yeah they're down 16th maybe 16th yeah they're, they, they're down to the nat's ass for sure nat's ass is pretty small for those who don't it's know it's a technical term for anyone technical wondering term. yeah that's a first for me thank you ed you've added to my building science vocabulary thank oh, you oh good, <laughs> good. <laughs> Fantastic presentation. Um, I really, uh, there's so many firsts on this project that it's hard to keep up. Uh, the first first was being declared a historic landmark before you broke ground. That's pretty cool. Uh, never heard of that before. And, um, you know, the Picha Kucha style speed with which you gave us the passive house perspective even though you have so many living building details that you can share. Um, I threw into the chat that during the after hour, you'd probably be happy to talk about those for those of you who weren't in the run through. Ed has about a million slides of all of that too. So be sure to uh, connect with him and Jake on LinkedIn because there's a lot to share. Um, and the 500 useful lifespan, 500 year useful lifespan. I think that's the first time I've heard that declaration. So amazing, thank you. Can, can we all cheers Ed and Jake and this amazing construction job before we jump into the questions? Cheers. Cheers guys. Cheers. Great job. Way to go, way to go. Thank you. Hey, there is a story on that 500 year. So there's probably some people on the line who know Mike Steffen. Um, and so originally the project came in, um, Mike came to me and he's like, hey, what do you think about this? Do you want to do this? And of course it was really exciting. So I, so I 
said yes. And he was friends with Paul Schwer, who's the president of PA Engineering. So we're going along. We're in that long pre-con period. And it was a weekend. And Paul sent us an email to Mike and I and said, what do you think? Of, what do you think about calling this a 500 year building? Do you, is that crazy? And so then we just there, there's this whole I'm sure a lot of people on the line have had these email threads where it's back and forth and back and forth. And uh, and we were trying to be realistic about it. And the longer we went back and forth, we're like, yeah, we it all, of course, depends on how well the building is taken care of, how it's maintained. But there's plenty of examples of very old wood buildings that were where they had no building codes at the time that are still standing today because the buildings were loved and cared for. And this is a beautiful building. And I, I don't remember who said it recently, but uh, they said that people really take care of buildings that are beautiful. And so I think you've given everybody a reason, not only because it's so beautifully designed and beautifully built, but because it looks beautiful. And I really love the high watermark and uh, the projected high watermark, pretty sneaky, <laughs> pretty cool. Although as Sean said, then that turns the lower level into a swimming pool. So you might have Great. to have a, a community pool in the future. <laughs> um, does any, was, any uh, Sean or Mark or Kevin, do you guys have any comments before you jump into any of the questions? No, I'm going to see if uh, we could hide some cameras, right? So if someone's walking up on this building and, and they see this brickwork, you, if you don't stop and stare at this brickwork, I don't understand your brain, right? So you're just in all of this brickwork and then bless your hearts for the people that executed it. That's a whole nother level. But the, the part where I want to put the cameras are following the people once they get inside and they make their way up the staircase. And lo and behold, there's this incredible, beautiful wooden staircase inside of this brick building. And, and oh, yeah, it's all thermally broken. Like, good night. Like, I, I really want to see people's faces as they, as they see it, because we got that behind the scenes as a group here tonight, but to, to someone walking down that street, they ought to get out their pom-poms and megaphones and, and cheer it on. It's beautiful. And don't forget, the staircase lights up when you walk on it. I mean, it's like big on the piano, right? It's, it's pretty awesome. Oh, yeah. I forgot about that. that the movie, yeah. Yeah. And Tom Hanks could be right there. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's truly an amazing project, you know, to see, re, you know, seismic concrete, CLT embedded with the brick facade. You know, you guys pulled out all the all the tricks on that. And then I know when I first learned the CLT, it was on like Discovery America about how you can make a really earthquake resilient building by using CLTs. And ironically, John and uh, down in Melbourne is experiencing a, an earthquake. But a lot of people don't know how 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 well CLT buildings do actually work in seismic areas so I, you know i know when i wear my hat when i take my hat off and i, I look at that building from a, as a fireman point of view i'm like oh this is a masonry building it's brick it's got to be made, uh, reinforced concrete or something like that and then to learn that it's clt did mm -hmm. you guys have any uh any any trouble with the local fire or, uh fire code or anything like that in, in in the city that is a great question um interestingly enough the project is a uh, kitty corner to the main fire station town. Uh, there's quite a few fireproofing details on the project. So we, we had previously been involved with the several other mass timber projects. Um, the first one was called Framework. That was a 12 story mass timber building. We got all the way uh, to almost a contract and then they decided it was too expensive and they didn't build it but in the process of getting and we, it was all the way to permit and all that stuff in the process of doing that it broke down a lot of the barriers in the local area with respect to mass timber construction the fire uh, how to deal with the fire details related to that and the seismic and just getting the code officials comfortable with it so that was kind of a trailblazing pre-construction effort and then on this project and there was there's some others around town so this isn't the only one um so the local officials are getting more used to it they did throw uh in like the first round of or not first probably the second round of plan review comments they did throw in quite a few fireproofing details 
it added some cost. Um, I took those out of this presentation, um, but basically most of the fireproofing is done with uh, uh, burying the connections in wood and the wood has a char rating. Um, and then there's a fair, there's some other just fire caulking that's applied in strategic areas. Um, we, and then we had some places where we needed to use wood plugs. So we'd have a connection, uh, we'd make the connection and then we had to come back and fit a wood plug in there to, to get that wood char covering that connection. And there was there's another spot where we use drywall to cover the connections. It's it's great to hear that other cities are uh, coming along and they're open minded. I know I was excited when I heard that it was in the international building code. I think it's Type Five construction now or something. But um, uh, it's it's nice to know that people believe in the science and the physics of how buildings burn, and they've been building them in Europe for many years. And it's good to uh, good to hear that. It's getting past the goalie in spots. I hope that New York uh, wisens up and listens to a knucklehead fireman and says wood buildings char. They don't. They don't fall down. So, but. yeah, it feels it feels a little bit like a movement to, to me, Kevin and uh, Jake. What do you think? I, it feels like a movement to me. All right, I was reading the comments. Uh, <laughs> busted. <laughs> busted. <laughs> what was the movement we're talking about? Moving toward mass mass, well, mass timber. Do you feel like there's a movement toward mass timber? Uh, a similar movement as there might have been back in the 20s towards plywood. I think if you look back at buildings built in the, sorry, the other 20s, the 1920s, they used this high-tech material called plywood to make really thin veneer structural and expressive things. I'll also add my little quip on this that I think we'll find that people start burying it inside of drywalls pretty soon too because they found that plywood, while interesting, isn't actually always beautiful forever. <laughs> so that said, I think CLT is having its heyday right now. We're going to see some really innovative design and approach with it. I think in the future, we'll just find it replacing concrete in a lot of circumstances because it's renewable in a sense. So. Well, all yeah. trends aside, uh, we have to thank you for being trailblazers in this effort because whether it's on trend or not, when you bump up against code and you're trying to do it right for the firemen and the occupants and yourselves and the details that you've already drawn, uh, that's not easy, right? Because it, it stops construction. <laughs> and um, one of the other things I was interested in was something that you mentioned, Ed, about PG&E when you were working with them on um, the energy component. Were there incentives or were there any back and forth moments? And I don't know if you're privy to them from the construction side, but if you were, could you share those? Uh, not so much from the construction side. Uh, you know, I got some insight because uh, we had a, a relatively cozy relationship with PAE because there we were all investors in the project in addition to being um, sort of core members of the team. And that was that created a really good dynamic, maybe a little bit like full design build where where everybody is pulling in the same direction. And uh, and so so I think maybe there was a little bit more shared there. At, at any rate, there was a lot of work with the electrical engineers from PAE between PGE uh, between the two. And my understanding is that the way that the grid works in this part of Portland, it's a it's a, a radial grid, and um, so they, they, which you know doesn't mean all that much to me to be honest with you. But it's different than the grid in the rest of Portland, for example. And so I think it 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 comes out from it it comes out from a certain point and it covers an area, and uh, they've only got so much capacity and so much flexibility and redundancy within that radius and they were concerned like oh if we do this like how reliable is it going to be and what sort of load does it put on on that on the grid if for example the building isn't producing the power that it needs and so there was a bunch of back and forth and calc I think a lot of calculations were done to say no we're never going to demand over a certain level this building will never need over a certain level, and therefore you can count on on this. 
And that I believe that's what got them over the hump. So what was really nice is we had a small pipe. I, I think it might've only been a one four inch conduit or something that went to a vault in the street that work didn't take all that long. And on most jobs, you'll hear our superintendents, project managers, every, everybody's like complaining about the power company. This is one job you can honestly say everything went great with the power company. They were responsive. We had no issues. It didn't hold up occupancy or anything. It was good. It sounds like efficiency sells. <laughs> I think it does. It makes your argument for you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, wow, it's 7.53 and all of us co-hosts have taken up a lot of the question time. So um, why don't we do the first question? And that's from Mo. Mo, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Yes, thank you. Uh, I was just wondering about the uh, and, uh, or the reason behind not putting micro grids for those PV panels. Uh, yeah, whether that was just cost related or other reasons. We have microgrid on the main building. Do you mean on the other building? Yes. Yes, I oh, think I saw a yeah, picture. Good, yeah. Yes, good question. Um, interesting. It, it that didn't come up. I suppose if we were if if we were being real purist, then it, we would have had it there. It would have been a pretty significant cost. Um, and we were retrofitting it on that other building. So we did, we actually had to come in and put the panels on post roofing and they're I mean, a little off topic, but you'll see where I'm going. That was like a thousand penetrations literally in that roof. So we weren't looking for growing the scope. Um, we, we were looking to make sure we were net positive energy. That was really the thing there. And the microgrid was kind of the um, cherry on top. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mo. It sounds like that answered your question. Mark, do you want to ask uh, Ed and Jake about our traditional question that we ask everybody who presents? I I'm caught up in the polls, but yes, of course <laughs> we do, gentlemen. Um, we, uh, we had a tradition founded by our, our own Kevin Brennan, and, and that is uh, acknowledging people that have made an impression on ourselves and our work. So if uh, Jake or Ed in any particular order, if you guys can please share with us a mentor in your life. I'll, I'll go here. Um, there, I've been fortunate to have uh, multiple bordering on many um, here, but here at Walt, so my dad, of course, um, cause he's like the smartest guy I ever knew and um, was pretty, he was a good role model and pretty humble. Uh, and there, my predecessor in the position, or yes, predecessor in the position I'm in, uh, his name was Chet Clock, and uh, he's just an amazing person. Very smart guy, very caring, compassionate, um, and funny. So, uh, I, you know, those two guys had a big effect on me. Well, Jake. being part of the uh, building science community, it'd be pretty easy for me to say Joe Stiebrick or Marty Houston or Mike Steffen or any of the guys that I work with or have learned from. But I'm John actually Trump. going to say, uh, and this is new to me because I haven't had this before, but my, uh, <clears throat> I'm expecting a new addition to my family. So my son, William James, in December has actually become... I would say the mentor that I look towards the most anymore because I'm constantly thinking about every action I do and how it's going to reverberate for him. And uh, he's also named after my favorite philosopher too. So it's, you know, it's a double-edged sword. I get two mentors out of one, but it's uh, that's probably where my focus has become. And I, I know it sounds a little cheesy, but it actually is very true in the last few months. It's literally every action I take. It's like, should I stay for an extra hour at work or should I go home and see my pregnant wife? Okay, I should go home and see my pregnant wife. Like that everything gets measured by that, that tune now, which it did not probably just six, six months ago. So. Oh gosh, I love that so much. Well, Jake, if you're lucky, it only gets harder and faster and better. So <laughs> you're off to an amazing start and we are all grateful for his presence in your life because what he's got you doing is nothing short of amazing. And Ed, 
talking about your dad, same thing, right? There's, there's a tree there and there's roots and there's leaves and, and the rest of us are somewhere in the middle trying to make it right, I think. Mm -hmm. So awesome, really awesome. Um, I think it's 7.58 and probably time to hand it off to Zach for a minute. All right, thank you, uh, Ed and Jake. This has been wonderful tonight. Thank you so much. Everything that we do at the Passive House Accelerator comes thanks to our sponsors. So I wanna give a big shout out to our founding sponsors, 475 High Performance Building Supply, Backstingui Architects, Glavel Foam Glass Gravel, Minotaur All-in-One HVAC and Dehumidification Units, Mitsubishi Electric Train HVAC US, Partel, RDH Building Science, Rockwell North America, Stocorp, and Zola Windows. Our champion sponsors are Sega and Icon Windows. Our stakeholder partner is NYSERDA, the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority. Thank you also to our patron sponsors, Aero Barrier, BR Plus A Consulting Engineers, Brennan Brennan Air Tightness and Insulation, Euroline Windows, Inotech Windows and Doors, Lamalux uh, Sanderson Sustainable Design, and US Engineered Wood T-Stud. So thanks to our sponsors. Tomorrow, we have part two of the PAE Engineers New Port Portland office uh, with Kathy Berg from ZGF Architects, M Mark Bruni from PAE Engineers, and guest host Mike Steffen from Walsh Construction. So please join us for this dive into the passive design uh, of this living building. Then next week on Construction Tech, we're joined by James Hartford of River Architects, who will be presenting about building passive house during supplies and labor shortages and the, the role that alternative, oops, little typo, alternative building systems can play in, uh, in that effort. On the Passive House podcast, the current episode features an a interview with Matthew Cutler Welsh. Um, Matthew interviews Maria Kayao of Sur Architecture uh, in Dunedin, New Zealand, and they touch on, on um, Maria's research around fuel poverty, very interesting conversation and findings and um, pretty serious issue in New Zealand, as well as her experience uh, living and being part of a community, a passive house co-housing community and, and her own uh, architecture practice. So please check that out. And finally, Passive House Canada's uh, Tower Retrofit Symposium starts tomorrow. So it's not too late to sign up and, and take part in, in that, in this uh, virtual retrofit sem symposium. And our own Sean St. Amour will be hosting a virtual social uh, after the first day. So after tomorrow's, the completion of tomorrow's um, program, uh, there'll be a, a social that um, we're doing in, in coordination with Passive House Canada. So join us for that. That's it. Thanks.